Hello and welcome to this Novo Religio interview with our authors. Uh, today we're interviewing Dr. Amy Hart. Dr. Hart is the state historian for the San Luis Obispo Coast District of California State Parks. She's based in Hearst Castle. So if you've been there, you know where she is. Her article is titled All in Harmony in that Department, Religious Expressions Within the Feuerist Communal Experiments of the 1840s. It was in Novo Religio, Volume 23, Number 2, November 2019, which was a special issue on the long 19th century and new religious movements. So, Dr. Hart, thank you for joining us. Thank you. So can you um, start by just uh, talking a bit about the, um, the article for those maybe haven't read it yet and uh, need to yeah, refresh it perhaps? Yeah, definitely. Um, so to give a little background, this article stemmed from my dissertation research, which looks at people and particularly women who joined the Fourierist intentional communities uh, that were started across the United States during the 1840s. So they were uh, intentional communities inspired by the writings of kind of French utopian thinker Charles Fourier. And he envisioned a world of more economic equality, essentially, uh, where people were paid for their labor, paid fair wages, and lived together. And there was better economic equality and also uh, equality for women. He wanted to create a more socially equal environment for women as well. And so in my um, my research, my dissertation, I really wanted to highlight the ways that women who join these communities were exposed to different social reform movements and ideas when they were part of these communities. And so in many ways, these communities acted as um, kind of incubators for social reform movements, because once they dissolved after just a couple of years of existence, which all of them did, um, these women then went on to become leaders and participants in some of the most enduring and important social reform movements of the mid 19th century, including the women's rights movement um, and the abolition movement and even kind of the founding of the Republican Party. So a lot of political movements as well. And so that's where I was going with my dissertation. And then when I was re doing the research on these communities, I also found that there was a lot of religious experimentation going on within these communities as well. And it became this really important kind of side point that didn't fit completely within the dissertation. And so it sort of had to become its own article in the end. Um, and so I used the same case studies in this article that I had researched my dissertation as well. I look at Trumbull Phalanx in Ohio, um, the Ceresco community in Wisconsin, also called the Wisconsin Phalanx, um, and then the Northampton Association in Massachusetts. And so I use them as case studies because they kind of offer these unique perspectives on the different ways that new religious movements were being experimented with and toyed with within these communal settings. Um, and so I look at a few different primary ways that these religions were being expressed and um, uh, played around with within these communities. And so one pattern I noticed was the emergence of this idea of Christian socialism really being expressed within the Fourierist communities. And that's something that would gain broader popularity later on in the 19th century and the early 20th century with the progressive era. But we really see kind of early iterations of this in these communities where people are using their Christianity um, as a basis for social equality and financial equality and socialism within their kind of financial uh, business dealings. And so they reference this a lot in kind of their early founding documents of the communities. They reference the Bible and biblical passages that justify their economic setup within the communities. And so I found that really interesting um, that that was kind of happening early on in the 1840s within these spaces. Um, another movement that you see a lot within the foyers communities is the idea of come outers. So mm -hmm. people who were very disappointed with their Protestant denominations or their churches that they had been a part of at that time, they then come out of those churches in order to say um, they're not doing enough to um, enact social reform. And they're um, kind of kowtowing to slave traders and people like that. A lot of Protestant churches were very nervous about coming out openly against slavery at that time. And so a lot of these foyerists were people who were very drawn to social reform. And they said, I need my Christian church, my denomination to support these social reforms explicitly. And so they came out of their churches and they were called come outers and they would kind of turn against denominations that were not being strong enough towards social reform activism and say, we need to find spaces where we can enact social reform um, on this kind of Christian basis with this Christian justice. And so you see that a lot within these communities as well. 
Um, and then another thing that was sort of played with early on within these foyers communities was the spiritualism movement. Um, and that would become much bigger and more widespread uh, later on in the late 1840s, 1850s and beyond. But you really see early iterations of it within the Fourierist communities, and especially at Soresco in Wisconsin. Um, they had kind of a spiritualist uh, like group of people who would get together and um, talk about these ideas. And it became really promoted uh, within these communities. And you have people who are willing to talk about these ideas together. They're progressive, like-minded thinkers. And so it became kind of a space of inoculation where these movements could take shape and be supported among like-minded groups. I love that your research and attention to, to these groups really upends the traditional way we tell the story. But the, the mid 19th century, because you know, so I, I teach a class in American religious history and the typical ways, of course, you talk about Finney and you talk about the mm -hmm. second great awakening. And then mm -hmm. I guess for spirituals and you start with the Fox sisters. And I mean, there's sort uh -huh. of a standard line and I love that, that your approach to it is sort of inverting it and saying, well, let's look at these other places where there's a lot more going on. And if you're just talking about, you know, the, you know, Finney's lecture tour, you're, you're, you're missing sort of what's going on in terms of the, um, what's happening on the ground. And it, I, yeah. I, it, Exactly. And that was sort of my overall thesis for the dissertation as well, that I really wanted to say we need to center intentional communities as spaces that are really important to the history of social reform activism in this country. And if we ignore intentional communities and their role um, in contributing to these later movements, then we're really missing a big piece of that history. That's a super important point. I suppose, I guess the only one which is usually mentioned is Oneida. I mean, people just sort of, you know, skim over everything yeah. else and maybe... It may be like Fruitlands gets a mention maybe, but it's just sort of like tucked in there somewhere. And I know, and it's so funny how those two are often very popular ones to mention because on the one hand you have Oneida and people love it because it lasted so long. And yeah. then Fruitlands is the opposite, right? It lasted like eight months, but it's just so popular because they were so eccentric and bizarre. <laughs> Everyone loves a good disaster story too. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I was just rereading your article before our conversation. I remember, I think you noted at the end of each section how long each group lasted, the three, and they, they weren't that long. I think the Wisconsin group, were, were they the shortest? Or I don't remember. Um, they were they they were very short, but they're kind of average. I mean, they're all, there's kind of this trope that foyerists are like four year, four year is, right? The idea that they on average yeah. lasted four years. And you see that um, throughout most of them in these case studies too. Though I, ironically, the Wisconsin Felix is seen as one of the most successful because people actually made money when they cashed out. Um, unlike many of these other ones that just went bankrupt and people lost money in their investments. Fascinating. So it, what also is interesting to me is, you know, I'm a, I'm a religion PhD. So I always sort of assume mm -hmm. people come to it from religion angle. I take it you actually coming from the history angle. And then sort of the, the religion side was sort of the, you stumbled into it maybe? Yeah, so I've definitely always had that interest in religious history as well, but I'm coming from clearly a historical perspective and I end up focusing much more on social reform activism yeah. and the history of that in the larger project. But this just became this kind of glaring subtopic that I couldn't ignore anymore. And it was very central to these community members' lives and it really motivated everything they did, um, particularly in communities like the Northampton Association. You explicitly see these community members like Sojourner Truth, right, is she, the central part of her identity is that she is a traveling preacher. She is a preacher for God and God's message is women's rights and abolition to her. And she, she really gets her start as a social movement activist leader in Northampton Association. Um, and she's kind of trained by David Ruggles, who's another abolitionist there. And um, he kind of tells her, how you, how you can go on this lecture circuit and gets her to have some of her first public lectures at the community. So it's a really interesting part because I think people in history classes learn about Sojourner Truth, but they don't learn about how she lived in intentional communities. Yeah. That's, um, when I, I kept it, when I got to that part of your article, I remember, I remember being excited. Thinking, oh, Sojourner Truth, that's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when people ask about the, the people, the women I highlighted in my dissertation, I always say, well, Sojourner Truth might be the one yeah, you've heard, you know, yeah. that's usually the one. <laughs> Um, I remember, so I think you said that each of the groups you looked at was almost, was almost like an ideal type where some of them were sort of, you know, the, the community became like the religion and for others, it was sort of the, um, it was about Christian socialism. Was the Northampton one, was that the one where the community itself was almost sort of religious itself or sort of, it, it became a stand-in for the people who had left the churches? Or, or yeah. So I, yeah. So I focused them on them a lot as kind of an example of the sort of come outers. So people who really had been disappointed with Protestant churches and the ways that they would not stand up against slavery explicitly. And the, the members who joined the Northampton Association were very much abolitionists at their core. Yeah. That was a big motive in their 
community that they wanted to show a post-slavery society and what it could look like within their community. So they're one of the rare communities in the 19th century that has African-American and white members living together as a community on equal social and economic footing. Because um, that was their vision. They wanted to show that this was possible. We could get beyond slavery and have this diverse society. Um, and so when churches didn't explicitly come out and support that mission, and in fact, were kowtowing the slave traders, um, they said, we're not going to be part of these churches anymore. And instead, they almost created this sort of mirror environment of the church setting where they would have Sunday community meetings and talk about social reform and women's rights and health reform and all of these progressive issues of the day. And so in some ways, the churches in the local area sort of saw that as a slap in the face, right? We're going to have our mirror image of church and it's going to be better than what church is. And they would even sometimes have women speak over these groups, which was very taboo at the time to have women speak in front of mixed audiences of both men and women. And of course, that wouldn't be okay with many of the, the Protestant clergy members. And so in that way, too, it was kind of um, mirror imaging what they said the church should look like in a more socially active environment. Can really see the power of these groups. So why is it most of them end up failing? I never heard of you know the the, the four year four year flares, but I, I love it. <laughs> it. What's I mean, given just how much of a draw it was and how powerful these communities were, what what causes them to fizzle? Um, it's it somewhat differs within each community, but um, the primary message is economic struggles. They weren't making enough money. They weren't bringing enough in. And they would invite members in who were very passionate about the mission, but maybe didn't bring any financial investment along with them. And so those people became mouths to feed and people to pay for the shared labor, but who couldn't bring in their own financial um, investment to keep the place going. So it was pretty much financial in the end mm. for a lot of them. Is that true for most of the Flores communities that you know of? Or was that just yeah that is it's financial struggles um and it becomes a lot of uh you hear a lot of bitterness kind of in letters um from these members saying you know i'm not being paid what i could be paid outside because they wanted to equalize what people were going to be paid and so if you're part of a certain industry that might have been paid more at that time um then you might become bitter about being paid the same as the farmer in the community or something like that and it's important to put them within their historical context as well because many of these started after um, there was an economic downturn, right, in the late 1830s. And so we see people joining these communities during a depression. And so it sounded really appealing during those years to share their housing, share their labor, kind of have this economic safety net, pull other resources together. But then by the time you get to the mid and late 1840s and you're pulling out of that recession, suddenly people could be maybe paid more again on the open market, maybe afford to buy their own house again. And so then you just see that kind of shift impacting these communities as well. That makes sense. I was thinking as you were talking about the 20th century uh, communities too, and some of the same patterns you see, different social historical contexts, but you see some of the same sort of, often it's the economic reasons like um, it's a total loss farm, the sort of examples of the mm -hmm. groups that just, I mean, they're, they're driven by great ideas, but they, they just can't survive there, whatever the economic climate is at the moment. Yeah. Um, Definitely. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you're a state historian now for uh, the California uh, parks. Uh, are you able to sort of bring any of this this work that you've been doing to sort of what you what you do in your day job, or is it um, uh, has that ship sailed? <laughs> Yeah, so it's been great to obviously just get the experience in historic research. Researching is central to my job as a public historian now. Um, and it's definitely a shift to be able to present history to the public in terms of exhibits and lectures and presentations um, and make it understandable in kind of this, this broader narrative way. Whereas of course I came from writing my dissertation just before this. And so that was very narrow and academic and theory driven. Um, and so that's an adjustment, which I guess to some degree it always is, even if you're just teaching an introductory history class, you have to make it much broader than you were in your research before that. There's some great California 19th century communities too, aren't there? Uh, yeah, I so part of your park district, but I but um, I imagine there's there's plenty to look at out there. Yeah, absolutely. California is is definitely a fascinating place, and it's where I was born and raised. So I'm excited to get back into that sort of history. Um, and I studied the 19th century, the 1840s, and the antebellum period for my PhD. But now working at Hearst Castle, I'm much more into the early into the early 20th century, mm -hmm. um, 1920s and 30s. And so that's been a whole new era to discover. And it's exciting to kind of get back to that roots uh, within the California setting. Mm 
Uh, well, thanks for joining us and thanks for talking about your about your research. Do you have, um, oh, I had one more question actually before I let you go. Yeah. So is there anything which didn't make it in, in the article, you know, the cutting room floor, the, the director's cut version? If, you, if we gave you an extra, you know, 5,000 words, what, what else would you have added that you weren't able to get in? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, I would say- <laughs> My dissertation, so there's probably, you know, a book's worth of stuff. Yeah, right? exactly, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> in the end, my dissertation, the final chapter of my dissertation was on Brook Farm, which mm -hmm. is another often talked about community because of its many famous members and visitors in the literary world, right? Like Nathaniel Hawthorne and Margaret Fuller was a supporter of the community, all these really famous people from that period. Um, and so, I think maybe if I had waited a bit to write this article after that chapter was completed, I could have included more people from Brook Farm. Um, and that would have been really fun. That was um, one of my favorite chapters to write. And I focused on Anna Blackwell, who was um, a member of the community for a, a little bit, and also a member of the famous Blackwell family. Her sister, Elizabeth Blackwell, was the first licensed doctor in the United States. So very famous social reformer family. Um, and she joined the community and then became an ardent spiritualist mm -hmm. afterwards. So that would have been a really interesting um, addition to add in. And then I also looked at Georgiana Bruce Kirby, who was another female member of Brook Farm. Um, and then she later moved on to California and became a women's rights activist and a very fascinating figure as well. So I loved writing about that, that chapter in my dissertation, but it didn't really have time to make it into this article, unfortunately. Maybe you can write another article for us sometime. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, well, great. Well, uh, do you have anything else to share with uh, those watching the uh, uh, the interview? Um, I, I hope I, I summed it up um, adequately. It was a, a fascinating period for me, the antebellum period, the 1840s and foyerist communities. And I hope that they'll be centered kind of in this history of social movements um, and religious experimentation going forward, because I think they really contributed this this great element to this history. It's a really great period. I'm so glad we could um, we could include it in the journal because too often in the study of new religious movements, we look at just the contemporary, uh, mm -hmm. look at sort of the way in which in the long 19th century, as the special issue did, and as, as your article did, focusing so tightly on this period, it really draws the historical lens in a way that we lose if we sort of decontextualize and then talk about, well, just, you know, new religions are just of the moment and not necessarily part of history. So anyways, well, thank you so much, Dr. Amy Hart. Thanks for chatting with us. And uh, for those watching the interview, there are links below where you can uh, connect to, um, uh, to read the article. So thanks again. All right, thanks.